So we go on uh, with our panel on Ionia transition. Just let me add one clarification to a question that came from the back, just to make it very clear. Esther is an overnight rate, just as Ionia was an overnight rate. So any issues of uh, credit spreads and uh, credit spreads varying over time, that's of course a question more of, of the term rates as, as the, uh, the, the person also indicated. And that's something we will discuss more in the afternoon. So it nothing, has nothing to do with Esther, but more with the development of, of term rates. So um, let us speak on the ESSER transition. Um, before we start, um, just to let you know, we have um, um, also planned for questions and answer sessions. And for that, I would like you to prepare because we would do it online. So everybody who has a mobile phone with, it, with you, you can log on to this website, www.menti.com and then indicate the code that I hope you can read uh, from, from all sides. So if you have any questions to the panel, please collect these questions. You can type them in there on this website. And at the end of the panel, we will then take up um, these questions. A colleague of mine will, will, um, will collect them and, um, and then read them out to us. Yeah? So just that you know that you start preparing now, maybe with your phones, that you can put the questions there. So. Um, as we have heard before, probably the transition from uh, Ionia to Esther is one of the more pressing issues that the working group and the financial industry has to deal with right now, um, in particular due to the deadline of the benchmark regulation um, uh, of 1st of January 2020, whereas the usage of Ionia will be restricted unless we have a postponement of this, of this rule. So let me introduce you um, the <laughs> panelists. So we have Yap Case from ING. Um, he's uh, supporting the chairman in his group, so he's a member of our working group on risk-free rates. We have Alberto Lopez, who's senior benchmark officer from EMI, the European Money Market Institute, so the administrator of Ionia and Euriber, who will recall the, Uri the Ionia reform and also talk about the role of EMI going forward in the transition process. And then we have Carlos Molinas, who is Global Head of Business Compliance at Credit Agricole, and uh, his institution leads the substream of the working group that deals with the transition of, um, of Ionia. So um, I would ask uh, Alberto to start with uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. So uh, I would like to, so my presentation will, will tackle the background as to why we're here and why the, all the work of the, the URFR uh, working group was necessary, and also try to uh, walk you through why we ended up uh, communicating to the market that uh, we would not pursue the, the Ionia reform. So it is, I think it is important to, to highlight that the Ionia is a major reference rate for the European many markets. Uh, it uh, seeks to represent the rate at which banks of some financial standing in the European Union and the EFTA lend funds in the overnight interbank money markets in Europe. Uh, it is worth emphasizing that there is a lending component. So other rates like Esther or the Euribo rates are borrowing rates. So EMI is the administrator of the Ionia benchmark and the ECB acts as its calculation agent. Um, it is fully transaction-based. It's a fully transaction-based benchmark, and it's currently calculated from the contributions of a panel of 28 uh, credit institutions across the EU. Uh, its use is broad, as you know, so it stands as the principal credit risk-free reference rate in the euro-denominated interest rate uh, derivatives markets. And as was mentioned before, uh, for long it was considered a robust and viable benchmark rate, supported by a robust governance framework. So since it was determined on the basis of executed transactions, uh, it already conformed broadly with international uh, best uh, practices. So in 2016, um, seeking to enhance the index's governance and align it with the requirements of the benchmark regulation, EMI launched the Ionia Review. As part of this program, EMI also intended to review and enhance Ionia's methodology in view of some shortcomings that uh, we had historically observed, and I would like to walk you through this because I think it's important to understand uh, why we are where we are. So as you can see here, Ionia volumes have decreased uh, since after the crisis years. So in the, earlier, uh, in the early 2000s, volumes never fell below uh, 
32 billion, increasing up to an average of almost 48 uh, during 2007 and 2008. Since 2009, however, the average yearly volumes have gradually declined to about 7 billion euro in 2017. During the first half of uh, 2018, the average Ionia volume was of 4.7 billion euro. On the 31st of October 2018, so just a few days ago, uh, Ionia was published on the basis of an underlying activity of 488 million euro. So it is necessary to highlight, it's important to highlight that Ionia does represent accurately the market that it intends to measure. So the current mon the monetary policy environment, along with other um, macroprudential measures, does not encourage and secure short-term lending between banks. So, uh, so just some evidence of this. According to the ECB, so on the left, you have a, a, a chart that was published by the ECB in their first consultation on, the, on Esther, and that there was a statement there. So it was a, a study of the size of the unsecured overnight money market based on target two data, and it said that volumes stood on average at six billion euro in September 2017. Ionia's average underlying volume in that same month was of 7.2 billion. So uh, what you can observe in these charts is that from June 2015 onwards, the contraction of the mark in the market become more apparent, and Ionia seems to capture the majority of the of the traded volume. In November, so further evidence uh, with respect to to uh, Ionia's representativeness of of the market. In November 2017, uh, the ECB started publishing statistics on the euro money market based on the data gathered in the context of uh, the MMSR, as Pascal just mentioned. So that's the same data that uh, will be used as a basis for, for building or for calculating Esther. The MSR statistics allow EMI to assess the representativeness of the benchmark and uh, just by comparing the volumes with the activity, so the ONIA volumes with the activity that was captured or that is reported uh, by the ECB on a, on a frequent basis. Also taking into account that the ONIA panel does contain seven banks that do not have reporting uh, obligations under the MMSR. What we could observe is that the ONIA panel captured about 80% of the MMSR overnight interbank lending activity in 2017. So if we go back to this slide, um, so I would like to, I mean, raise your attention to the concentration of the rate. So this limited market activity has been mirrored by, uh, by an increase in the concentration of uh, the underpin uh, underpinning volumes in a very limited number of Ionia contributors. So if we look at the period between 1999 and 2009, approximately 51% of the, of the total daily volume, the total uh, Ionia daily volume, was reported by the top five most active, uh, active banks in the panel. Uh, between 2010 and 2015, the average increased to 72%. And in 2017, about 88% of the volume was reported by the top five contributors. So Ionia is becoming a very concentrated benchmark. <coughs> so if we look at the number of uh, Ionia contributors that submit because so these 20 banks on a daily basis they do report their volumes uh, and their their uh, volume weighted average trade of all the trades that they've had uh, over the day regardless of whether they had activity or not they do report their lack or activity otherwise and uh, so what we have here is a representation of the non-zero volumes so what we can see is that uh, Ionia contributors, which submit non-zero volumes, uh, so the number, has decreased significantly in the past few years. So between 2004 and 2009, so that would be the top chart, uh, approximately 69% of Ionia contributors made non-zero contributions towards the index. Uh, and in 2017, so the most recent uh, data that we have there, Yearly, yearly averages, 38% uh, reported on a daily basis overnight unsecured interbank uh, lending activity. 
So these trends, again, should not be surprising because they were already uh, somewhat reported by the ACV in the first consultation on, on Esther. So this decrease in the number of Ionia panel banks uh, has, of course, been reflected in the decrease in the number of countries represent, represented in the rate, and that would be the bottom chart. So what you can see is that uh, so it would be the blue, uh, the blue line, and what you can see is that in 20. 18, so in this year, in the beginning of this year, the number of uh, countries represented by the rate, or at least with uh, non-zero emissions, uh, has decreased, and it's now it stands at, at between five and four. So, in view of the observed participation in geographic, uh, geographical con uh, concentration, and also given, so taking into account the perceived lack of appetite for a so the market's uh, lack of appetite for a fully-fledged Ionia review. On the 1st of February 2018, this year, uh, we communicated on our intentions to stop any efforts related to the alignment of the Ionia index with the requirements of the BMR. So in particular, as it was uh, mentioned before, we highlighted that truth conditions and dynamics of the unsecured segment of the money market remained un unchanged. Ionia's compliance with the EU BMR by January 2020, that is the deadline that uh, the regulation imposes, could not be warranted. So the work of the EURRFR uh, working group since the first meeting and over the last few months, so uh, the first meeting in February and over the last few months has been intense. EMI has collaborated, providing its expertise as administrator of two of the four critical benchmarks uh, declared by the European Commission. Uh, now, following the identification of Esther as the recommended alternative reference rate to Ionia, we are we stand ready to support the market in the transition towards the, the new risk-free rate. And uh, it must be clear that uh, we intend to continue with the publication of Ionia for as long as the stability of the panel uh, of contributors continues, and until the market. Uh, considers that is necessary. Thank you. That's all. Thanks very much. <laughs> so then we hand over to uh, Carlos Molina. So there was already a question on how to deal with a nine basis point spread between Esther and Ionia. I suppose you can also say something about this in sure. your presentation. Sure. Thank you, Cornelia. First of all, it's an honor and privilege as <coughs> personally as a representative of Group Credit Agricole to be here. Uh, and thanks, Alberto, for this introduction. That's great. So uh, I, I'm going to start moving because uh, I'm from Barcelona. And, and uh, as you know, in Barcelona, uh, we have La Ramblas, which is, is a great uh, place <laughs> for people like me to move up and down and down and up, just, just to, 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 to make sure that, uh, that I, I, I deliver the right message. So I'm the chair of subgroup four. The subgroup four is a great group, more intelligent and far more intelligent than me, which is a great situation to be. And I will try to explain what is the situation of our thought right now on the SG4. A uh, lot of things are not set in stone. A lot of things, they are projections. This is what we intend. So, but for, we're conscious of transparency. We want to be as transparent as possible. And the deadlines are very short. So we want you to be informed of what is our line of thought. So the agenda is going to be describing, we have to move from one side to the other. So the best case scenario, where are we today? The objectives and challenges of the subgroup four, from A to B, Ionia to Esther, the gap analysis and the potential transition path, and the next steps and actions for the subgroup four. So uh, I, I would like you to imagine that this transition is like from moving from one boat to another boat. So we have the boat, we are all together in the boat called Aeonia, and we have to move to another boat, which is called Esther. So this boat we know, Alberto just said, is sinking. So if it stays like this, and the new boat, we know more or less how it works, because the ECB has told us, but it's not yet there. So we have to move, so no pressure. <laughs> so <coughs> we have the best case the scenario as of today. We know that Ioni is used as a reference for floating payments in derivatives and cash products, but as well is used as an OIS curve for discounting the value of the future cash flows. This is very important. 
Legacy books, or called back books, they are alive. They are dynamic. They generate cash flows, future cash flows. And this is not the only books, but the rival books. And these cash flows, they are most of them valued using OIS. And OIS, guess what? Use Ionia. So we depend on this curve, not only for the back book, but for the future book, not only for the OIS book, but as well for the rival books. As the 1st of January, Ionia, in its current form, if it stays as it is, it will not be BMR compliant. So if Ionia stays as it is, the worst case scenario is that the owner will be prohibited for new contracts and for legacy books as the 1st of January 2020. And the best case scenario is that FESMA decides that it will be only prohibited for the uh, future, uh, for future usage. So the question is, can you value your legacy books and the cash flows from your legacy books using a curve that you are prohibited to use? I'm a head of compliance. If I was a head of risk, I would say no. You cannot use a curve that is not liquid to value future cash flows. So our best case scenario, if we stay as it is, is catastrophic. I mean, liquidity in the OAS will disappear due to BMR prohibition, and valuation and risk management for these future cash flows coming from any book uh, we will be impaired. So, what are the objectives and challenges for the subgroup four? So do nothing is by far the worst course of action. So if we do nothing, we hit a wall. So we're in a car, we're driving 120 kilometers an hour, there is a wall there. And we know the brakes are not enough, so we have to steer right or left. So we have to do something. Do something involves risk. So if we steer right or left, we may have an accident. We can hit somebody, but we have to do something. And this risk depends on how radical the transition path is. So the market needs to move from a non-sustainable benchmark to a sustainable benchmark as per the 1st of January 2020. And we are committed to give a solution before the 1st of January 2020. So identify, recommend, and communicate a transition path from Eonia to Esther as smooth as possible that protects market integrity and is the fairest to all benchmark users. So if we want to go from one boat to another boat, the first thing that you have to do is to measure what is the distance between the two boats and what is the difference between the boat that you are in and the boat you are moving to. So we have Eonia, the boat we are in, we have to move to Esther. So, Amazingly, so we have to look at the difference and uh, what are the similarities. They start with an E. That's great. <laughs> Why? Because they are euro rates. That's great. I feel happy now. Ionia is overnight rate. Great. Esther is overnight. I feel even better now. Ionia is unsecured, whatever that means. And Esther is unsecured as well. So I... Uh, I feel quite good now. Is transaction based? Esther is transaction based. Wow. We have an unstable panel. So the panel has been uh, uh, going down as my gray cells in my brain. So there is, it goes down by the time. And Esther is in a stable panel because it depends on uh, regulatory data, which is great. So Eonia has a narrow panel. Esther has a wider panel. So now I, I not only feel good, I feel really optimistic, very optimistic. But there's always, always a fly in the ointment. So Eon is bank lending. Esther is bank borrowing. So there is a difference. It has to be different because uh, as everybody in this room, we have to make money. And then we're at the ECB. So every time the banks, they do something, we have capital charges. So between bank lending and bank borrowing, there is a difference. It has to be. And then, last but not least, Eon is published on T, and Esther is published on T plus one. That's a very important one. So I don't want to paraphrase the George Bush administration, but you have known knowns, no unknowns, and unknown unknowns. So one of the known knowns is that it's going to be published on T plus one. So be prepared, that's the message. The future is T plus one. So be careful with your systems, be careful with the way that you're calculating the things. So in the future, 
the future is t plus one, not t. Okay, so that's a complicated one, and I apologize because it's going to be quite complex. Uh, but I will get you to a road that we are following on the SG4. So the key question is to determine suitable ionized transition paths. So we have to identify what are the different paths that are available to us. So I don't know if you have long drives with your kids, but uh, uh, I have this game and really the kids, they imagine an animal and then we ask questions, you know, it has four legs, is a mammal, etc., And we have to define what is, what is the animal. So is a dog or is a cow. So here's the same. We're going to ask questions to define what are the transition paths that are available to us. So, first question, will Ionia and Esther publish in parallel or will Esther succeed the Ionia beyond the BMR transition date? So, do we want the two boats to navigate together or do we want one boat to disappear and the other one to appear at the same time for everybody to move? Will Ionia and Esther be independent rates or will the methodology of Ionia evolve to become dependent on Esther beyond the BMR transition date? This is a long question. But again, in the similarity of the boards, do we want to have a distance that is measurable and is constant, or we want a distance that is going to move? Of course, if it's moving, it's going to be more difficult for us to jump. If it's fixed, we know what is the distance we can calculate, how to move from one to the other. And then, can an oniester spread smooth in the transition? Do we have to have a distance that is set up in a stone? And can Ionia OES and Esther OES discounting curves coexist? That's a good question, because if we have two boats, if we have two curves, these two curves can be used for discounting the cash flows. So do we allow for these two discounting curves uh, or use only one? So we have to keep in mind that the end of the BMR transition period is the 1st of January 2020, and we have to go from A to B before the 1st of January 2020. Okay, so here we go to the transition path. So asking those questions, we're going to analyze how many paths we have. So A and S the relationship beyond BMR <coughs> compliance. Do we want a relationship with them? We, we want these two boats to stay. So we want to be independent. So both boats are moving. We not, do we want a parallel publication? We can say it's necessary because the two boats will coexist, so they have to be published. Do we want a spread? This question is not applicable. Do we want a parallel discounting? If we want a parallel discounting, we go to parallel run approaches. This is the ARC based transition plan. This is the US. They're moving from uh, LIBOR <coughs> to SOFR. SOFR is very different. This boat is moving a lot. It's, the distance is quite big and it's moving. So they need time and a time to move. Do we want, do we, want, we don't want parallel discounting, so we can contract with alternative approaches and we go to the Swiss market transition. The Swiss market transition, they did more or less the same as US, but they decided one day they will move from one boat to another boat. They did that, why? Because there's no many people in the boat and it's quite concentrated. Can we do the same with the Euro? I'm not sure. We have far more people in Eonia than we have in Toys. Second, the question we go is, has to be dependent relationship. Do we want these two ships to be dependent? Do we want a parallel publication? If we don't want a parallel publication, do we want a spread? We don't want a spread. We want parallel discounting. It's not applicable. This is a pure succession. It's like a king abdicates, and then we have the prince taking over of the kingdom ship. So this is the UK market transition. So there is, they say, you know, they are very cunning in UK. They said, we're, we're going to change the name of the boat. So it's going to be Reform Sonia. And there is no need actually to move because this boat is not going to be much better. Then we go back and we, ask, we say that uh, Esther and Ion are dependent. There is a parallel publication. We have a parallel publication and they're both dependent. Do we want a spread? Big question. Do we want a separation? We want the distance that has to be fixed and frozen between the two ships. We say yes, let's freeze, so then we can measure the, the, the size of the jump. And do we want parallel discounting? We can say yes, recalibration, we call spread dual discounting, or no, 
we're going to use one single curve to discount all the, all the, all the gas flows, and then we call it recalibration spread, clean discounting. Those are two uh, potential transition paths, two more paths that we have. So we have one, two, three, four, five paths. We go back and we say, we want a spread between ester and ionia. We say, no, we don't want the spread. They are the same thing. We want a parallel discounting. Not applicable because we say ester is equal to ionia. So we call it the recalibration, no spread. And then there are two, finally, there are two other ones that they do not exist for, for completeness. I just put it on because we said we, want, we don't want parallel publication, but we want parallel discounting. It doesn't make any sense. So again, think about it. It took me an hour of my time to understand all of this. So I don't expect to understand right now everything, but have a look. And if you find another path, please let us know. Fine, last but not least, what the envisaged next steps, and then again, this is not written, it's not in stone, that can change, but uh, for, for, we want to be transparent. So as the 1st of December 2018, the SG4 agrees and presents its report to the main work stream. The main work stream, the Euro Risk Free Rate, endorses these recommendations, and again, we are a group of experts that we are recommending, we are not executing, we are recommending. Then, uh, by Q1 2019, uh, we consider the potential market feedback. And again, be careful because the, 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 the deadlines are so tight that you will have a very short period of time to answer the questions that we will ask. Uh, and it's going to be, unfortunately, during the Christmas period. So, uh, so be, be prevented. If we do th this, it's going to be a very short time. And then the recipients of the recommendations, they will perform the evolutions, which may involve, again, public consultation, but formal public consultations. Then Esther starts getting published on Q3 2019, and the transition achieved uh, before the 1st of January 2020. And here's the finish of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, maybe to allow for some time to collate the questions, uh, maybe a short wrap up of both sessions. So I think Carlos made, uh, uh, or Alberto made quite clear that Aeonia's lifetime yeah, is ending, quite an exciting lifetime, but now I think volumes and concentration are a big problem. So we need to find a solution. And there, of course, Carlos is, wor Carlos is working on. I think it's important to note, yeah, Aeonia is not only used in short dated cash instruments or in short dated derivatives, it's also used in very long dated derivatives. So there are outstanding contracts that go years beyond the 2020 deadline. And it's important to note that also uh, Aeonia is used for valuation purposes across the industry for derivatives, but also for insurance companies, for example, on the liability base. So it's a very important uh, <coughs> benchmark. The best case scenario, as Carlos already explained, is yeah, that we can still use Aeonia for legacy contracts, uh, but no longer for new contracts uh, for 2020. But it's still a very challenging uh, uh, and actually a catastrophic scenario because we, we can't simply rely on a benchmark that we can no longer use. So we need to move, we need to act. Uh, and I think everybody should realize that also in our companies we need to act. It's not only the working group working on some replacements, but also in the industry, in the market participants. Yeah, we need to work on our systems, we need to work on our processes, and uh, uh, that will be a big task. Uh, important questions we still face. Do we need a transition? I think, yeah, the answer is actually yes. Do we need it directly, or do we need it over a certain period? Uh, what is the spread methodology? We will come out and share our analysis, and hopefully we will receive some feedback from you. There's still a lot of work to be done, that's clear. Uh, I think it's also a good conclu uh, uh, conclusion would be that the task is very complex, the stakes are extremely high, and time is short. So it's a big challenge. Okay, so I hope that you have gathered some questions and put them into this Mentimeter survey. My colleague Philip would then, um, Philip Molitor, also from the DG Market Operations, would uh, then start reading out some of the questions to the panel. Do you, Mendy, uh, do you have a microphone? Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. So I would like to thank 32 uh, participants who have submitted uh, questions, still questions coming in. 
Uh, some relate still to this session before. I would like to point them to our website for additional information on uh, Esther. Some participants are impatient and ask questions on the following section. So um, I would like to concentrate on two themes that came up here. One is on how the panelists, uh, what type of inst legal instruments they see could be used for supporting a change to, uh, uh, from Eonia to Esther, what you see uh, the likelihood of that happening and uh, whether that would be your preference. And I think a second question relates to a possible um, Eonia defined as Esther plus a spread, whether that would require an uh, authorization or would automatically be BMR compliant. Thank you. You want to take the floor, Carlos? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, I can. <coughs> I can answer the the the, f the first one. The legal instruments. I mean, legal instruments is quite vague. Uh, so, what we're trying to do uh, uh, is to use uh, to avoid as much as possible the lawyers. So that's a good idea. Um, sorry if you have the lawyers in the room, but uh, we're trying to avoid uh, fallback. Uh, uh, the use the fallback. Uh, provisions. The fallback provisions are an instrument that is a red button that you have to push only in case of an emergency. What we're trying to do is to make an evolution of the current Ionia to make it BMR compliant. So that's what we're trying to do. This is our aim and our objective. If you guys you have to use the provisions of the fallback or you have to use prepapering, so that will not be success for us. So our group intends to have an, a smooth transition as smooth as possible. And the second one is that whether uh, uh, an authorization will help. Sure, I mean, uh, an authorization uh, for the new Aonia, if we decision is take to, to reform the, the Aonia, it will be very helpful. It will be very helpful because it will endorse actually the new methodology uh, it will make, make it clear for everyone, for the users and the producer and the administrator of the benchmark to make a smooth transition. So this is a key element as well if we go for that uh, particular path uh, for, 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 for moving from one boat to another. We, we need to know that the new boat and the new ship is authorized and is supervised by a supervisor. So with regards to the authorization, uh, so any, so the authorization comes from from the public sector, and in, in the case of uh, of EMI is the the Belgian uh, FSMA. So it would it is something that we are discussing uh, with them, and uh, whether we would actually require uh, to apply for authorization. But in any case, it has to be emphasized that the whole idea of uh, this smooth transition is for the market to have time to transition. So it, it should not be taken, so if Amy uh, were to redefine Ionia as a spread uh, to Esther, it is not as a means for the market to keep on using Esther, uh, Ionia as it was. So it is for the market to actually have time to transition to the new rate. So you should not expect Ionia to be there forever. Yeah, and I think the working group will, of course, take the initiative, but we will work closely together with uh, also the, the, uh, yeah, the EC, with the ECB, with FSMA, with ESMA, to do, do this really in a concerted way. Uh, yeah, there is probably no, no risk scenario. Eh? The whole full legal means to enforce this are not available. I think if we do this in full transparency and also in a full concerted way, we should, uh, we should be successful. So that's, uh, that's the idea. Philip, are there further questions? I think there would be one other. And it's the question, will Eonia and Esther be published in parallel, or will Esther succeed Eonia beyond the BMR transition date? Uh, that's, that's, again, is uh, a known unknown. So uh, we're, you know, we're thinking about uh, which one is better. So we have establishing right now what is the criteria that we will use to establish which is the best, the best path. So if uh, one is stops being published and the new one is getting published, it's got some pros and cons. So the pros are obviously that there's clarity. We know where we go. 
uh, the cons is that uh, you know some people may not know that the first one is going to disappear. So especially consumers and and people that they are less sophisticated may sink with the first boat, uh, and not knowing that they have to move to the new one. So there's plenty of things that uh, that we are considering. We're establishing what is the criteria that we have to use to uh, determine what is the best path. Uh, again not clear but is known and known we are working on it and again if you have any questions and uh, you have to you 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 want to to raise questions uh, you know that the, our minutes are published we are very transparent and again the group is still open especially for people that uh, they are the users and the consumers Philip there are questions coming in but uh, they are rel relate a lot to the to the future on, on Esther and a new um, monetary policy environment. Um, I think those we cannot tackle here either, or we already said that it is an unknown. So I think um, from the topics that I see here, we have covered everything. Okay, thank you very much. So for the afternoon session where we will talk about term rates, we will have another question and answer session. So then I understand some of the questions that came in already, we can then better tackle in, in that environment. Um, so, um, yeah, so as uh, Carlos outlined, there will be a public consultation once the working group has a recommendation. So I would also invite everybody to look at that then carefully once it comes out. And uh, if you have uh, new ideas, thoughts, to also participate in this consultation. Do you have any other concluding words? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's very important to reiterate that yeah, it's not only the working group that is now doing this work. Eh? So we are trying to find a replacement benchmark for Ionia, uh, but it's also try to start already within your companies to look, okay, inventorize, where do I use Ionia, uh, for which kind of products, which kind of processes, it's in valuation, it's in risk management, it's in hedge accounting, it's financial accounting. Yeah, it's, we have to be ready for something that we don't know the outcome for, but at least we need to do the preparations uh, within the financial industry, and we have to start with that. And it's a difficult one because you don't know the, fi the final outcome, but we don't have the luxury to still s uh, sit and wait. So that is, I think, an important message we need to give. Okay, if there are no further questions on this topic, then I would suggest that we break for lunch. So we have time until 2 p.m. Lunch will be served outside here on the balcony, so you will go to the, to the right-hand side. Um, yes, so please enjoy our beautiful building.